Welcome to the Vax Up Podcast, a podcast that shines light on health organizations who use social technologies to get accurate vaccine information to their communities. This show is brought to you by the Bay Area Global Health Alliance and the Sabin Vaccine Institute, both members of the Alliance for Advancing Health Online. Vax Up is produced by the team behind a Shot in the Arm podcast. And now here's our host, global health strategist and advocate, Ben Plumley. And let me add my welcome to this episode of the Vax Up podcast, where we are profiling interesting collaborations to promote vaccine confidence through the use of digital media and social networking platforms. In this episode, we are flying up to the 38,000 foot level to look at a selection of the Vaccine Confident Fund's grants, some that we've covered in previous podcasts, and one that we've just got hot off the press results on, as well as other approaches that our panelists have taken to engage hardly reached communities. All of this to ask the question, can these tools build trust in healthcare systems amongst those communities hardest to reach? Without doubt, there are ramifications and opportunities for public health outreach strategies outside of vaccine confidence, as well as in other communities and in other settings. But before introducing our panel today, I first want to recognize that Sacramento, where I'm recording from, is the ancestral homeland of the Nisenan, Maidu, Miwok, and Mewuk peoples, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Our first guest then is Trevor Stratton, Canadian First Nation and international indigenous health advocate and community leader. Trevor is from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation Canada, He's widely known in global health circles as a passionate and effective advocate for the rights of Indigenous communities, particularly in infectious disease. He's a nationally respected leader in Canada's First Nation communities as they address the wrongs and the challenges they face with health authorities, only made more visible by COVID. And he is in the process of building a new home from scratch. Trevor, how are you doing? I'm doing well. A little tired doing with all the heavy workload. I'm sure, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but thanks for inviting me. Well, it's great to have you here. I know it's been a, a, taken a while to get you on the show again and uh, uh, loving the concrete foundations that you've been able to install in your, in your new home. We're also joined by Nadia Diamond-Smith, Associate Professor in the Epidemiology and Biostatistics Department and Institute for Global Health Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Her expertise is in maternal and reproductive health in the developing world, with a focus on gender inequality, women's empowerment, family planning, abortion, nutrition and pregnancy. She's a public health demographer, and she joined us in an earlier VaxArt podcast to talk about her collaboration with the Maya Health Alliance, Nadia, it's great to have you back. I'm glad we didn't scare you off. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to be back. Thanks, Ben. And rounding out today's panel is friend of a Shot in the Arm podcast, our sister podcast, Georgia Arnold. Georgia is the Senior Vice President of Social Responsibility at Paramount, and she's the Executive Director of the MTV Staying Alive Foundation, which produces MTV Sugar across Southern, East, and West Africa, as well as India. Georgia, welcome to Vax Up. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Ben. I love doing these with you. Now, as I was looking at your resume, I see that you were also head of VIS Social Impact. What on earth does that mean? Well, for Paramount, I produce a lot of the social impact content. So it can be scripted or unscripted documentary series, um, anything that covers climate equity or health. Um, and I think most importantly, we have to ensure that we're creating impact at the back of it. So it's not just about a water cooler moment with a documentary series. It's about what are we doing with our audience to carry them along once they understand the messaging? How can they understand their choices or take part in activations um, and uh, stuff like that. Now, for our Vax Up audience that may not be so familiar with MTV Sugar, could you give us the brief elevator pitch? MTV Sugar has been going for 12 years now. Um, it's a mass media campaign and we 
placed them in different countries. So in Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire and India, where it's called MTV Nished, which means taboo. And we use all platforms to reach young people, to give them information about their sexual reproductive health and rights, also about uh, TB, mental health. And most recently, of course, we got involved with COVID as well. And for us, with all the innovations around healthcare, it's about giving young people the choices that are available to them so they can make their own decisions. Well, let's get right into it, shall we? The challenges of building confidence, uh, vaccine confidence in hard to reach communities. So the Vaccine Confidence Fund has funded projects over the last year to look at those challenges and look at the solutions that digital and social technologies can have as communities and the healthcare providers that serve them, particularly vaccine implementers, build confidence in vaccines. And there are two projects that have stood out to us here at VaxUp. The collaboration that Nadia has been involved in between Maya Health, UCSF and Stanford University, reaching indigenous rural women in Guatemala, and a collaboration between the Star Blanket Cree Nation and the University of Saskatchewan's Morning Star Lodge, a research institute designed to work specifically with First Nation and Indigenous communities. Now, these are projects that are important in their own right, but they serve as a useful entry point to broader efforts to engage these hardly reached communities. So, Trevor, if I may start with you, Indigenous vaccine hesitancy is not just limited to COVID-19, is it? A major issue right up front is that the public health community does not have an adequate understanding of the challenges First Peoples face. Indeed, even in recent history, it's a relationship that's been hostile, controversial. Could you share some of the context and historical background about why there is such distrust in medical authorities in the communities that you serve? Well, I think uh, it's not just medical authorities uh, there's mistrust of, but it's authority in general or any kind of a system or governance that isn't indigenous because our ways are, are a lot different um, than what we call settlers. And many of our communities are, are remote or even isolated, meaning like fly-in communities. Even women, when young women who have never left their community before, when they want to have a baby, they have to fly out to do that or to go see a dentist or things like that. So there's that issue. But there's been, over hundreds of years, there's been a lot of different people and groups and governments knocking on the door, scratching on the teepee, whatever you want to call it, you know, with this thing saying, here's a book. This has all the answers. Just take this book and everything will be fine. But the book wasn't written by us or for us, you know, these, these, um, these systems that come our way. And the messaging that's made, you know, the public health messaging is made by and for settlers as well. And it doesn't resonate with indigenous people. A lot of I, in my experience and what I know from my friends, family and uh, community is that a lot of indigenous people look for information from trusted friends and family and relatives. And if it comes from them, they'll believe it. But if it comes from someone they don't know in a, in a white lab jacket, you know, there's still that, a lot of that mistrust. But, the, but it's also a lot of misinformation can be passed this way. So if our community members have the factual information, the, 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 it's not gossip. It's, it's actually, you know, whispering into your friend's ear, this is, this is the truth. This is the fact. And that's what we pass to our friends and family instead of perhaps misinformation. Our infrastructure in communities is, is very often not very, um, uh, not uh, very well developed. Resources are quite scarce. There's housing shortages, overcrowding in houses. Sometimes people, families are sleeping in shifts because there just isn't enough room. There's a lot of turnover in our workforce as well. And many of our communities are very, very small. So the role of a community health representative, the CHR, which most of our communities have, they're different. This description of their job is different in each community. So one can be, uh, you know, as, as, as high up as a registered nurse or, or that. And another, in another community, the CHR might be, uh, her health might, uh, background might be that she's been to three or four health conferences. You know, there's boil water alerts because our groundwater is poisoned in many of our communities here. There's no sidewalks, people getting run over, you know, and some communities are just connected by footpaths. That's how um, underdeveloped or, 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 you know, 
no roads in, in these isolated communities. That, that's some of the issues without going too deep into it. Nadia, I, I wonder, listening to, to Trevor, um, how do the, the challenges that he's just articulate resonate with you in the work that you and the Maya Health uh, Alliance addressed in Guatemala? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, a lot of those issues really resonate with with what my colleagues at um, the My House Health Alliance in Stanford and I found in our work. The you know the way information had been crafted and developed you know, often didn't resonate with the communities we were working in. And one of the things that we really ended up finding and highlighting in our work was the importance of language. You know, in the rural Mayan communities, there's many different languages that are spoken, and so often the content that was delivered to these communities was in Spanish, which many people didn't speak. And so something as simple as just being able to create information in the language that people were more familiar with, we found seemed to be very important to people for their trust, but also actually was able to lead to them, you know, having more information and being able to act on those health behaviors. And, and as a researcher yourself, Nadia, um, hearing what Trevor said about the the uh, sometimes difficult relationship with researchers, how have you in your work, both with uh, with the Maya Health Alliance, but also in India, how have you sought to address that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a hard question, but something I do feel like the global public health community is thinking more about and talking more about. Um, and I'm very heartened to hear students pushing for that and senior faculty starting to integrate that into how they're designing their research and how they're working with partners. Um, you know, I think one thing that I've always focused on, and I think a lot of my colleagues do, is building partnerships from the beginning with, you know, not just researchers in the different contexts that we're working, but also local community partners so that, you know, I mean, I think people talk a lot about community engaged research, you know, but so it's not just once you get there, you have a community advisory board and talk to them, them but it's a few steps back when you're first figuring out like, what do we need to work on? What does the community want? You know, what are the important topics? I might think something's really important, you know, from my, you know, California office, but that might not be what really resonates with the needs of a certain population. So I, I, I feel I've been really heartened and excited to see how many people are building partnerships over many, many years with local community groups and organizations so that they can then direct their research towards meeting those needs. But it's, you know, it's a hard thing to do. COVID made it harder in many ways when we're, you know, stuck <laughs> in, in our office or in our homes. Um, but I think, I, I really believe that the times are changing, but it's a hard, it's a hard relationship and one that requires a lot of time and commitment and energy on both sides. And Georgia, if, if we look at the work that you and your teams have done in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and, and India. Um, the, one of the primary reasons for you doing MTV Sugar is precisely because these young, young folk don't trust or have concerns about their interactions with the health, um, health authorities. So how do you respond to what you've heard from Nadia and, 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 and Trevor? How does it resonate with you? I think, well, first of all, it's so interesting hearing both of you speak. And um, I think for us, it really resonates because what we hear from our audience time and time again is that even if they know what they want, even if they know where to go, so often they turn up at a clinic and they're laughed at by a nurse or they are dismissed by a nurse because they're too young, they're not married, they're not given the access to actually what they are, we're empowering them to ask for. And it's a real challenge. And I think, you know, for us, what we're, we're really looking to do is make sure that we work both with the, the, the young people where we really want to shift social norms with, but also, we know that increasingly, we have to work with the norm holders as well, in order to make sure that we can, it, it's all very well giving a young person choices and options. But if you're not changing the norm holders perspective, then how are you, you you're never really going to change anything, not in the long term, you're not going to reach that tipping point. Now, Nadia just touched on something as well, Georgia, that that really strikes me that COVID-19 changed everything, you know, we were in our homes, uh, we weren't able to be out in the communities. And I just, 
I guess I just wonder, it's a question for all of you, I guess, how has COVID-19 transformed the uh, approaches that you've taken to interacting uh, with communities? And, 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 and Trevor, maybe I could kick off with you first. Yeah, that's a really good question because, like, there's around 600 First Nations communities in Canada. There's many uh, Inuit hamlets and, and Métis settlements. Uh, but there was a study, an international study, that was done by Indigenous researchers on HIV um, in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, and it really it showed that high mistrust in healthcare services. But for the most part, here. Most indigenous um, community leaders implemented social restrictions, and and in many cases those restrictions were um, more stricter than provincial guidance from health authorities, and with roadblocks in and out of the community and things like that. Most of our communities did distribute vaccine shots themselves, but of course there's, there was also quite a bit of resistance by our indigenous citizens. They don't necessarily agree with the with the leadership. Lots of conspiracy theories are in circulation. What's in it? Microchips, cells from human fetuses. And, you know, I know someone that's died from vaccinations. I don't know how many times I heard that. I don't know how, how that's possible since it's such a, a, such a small statistical note, you know. But as COVID dragged on, a lot of people got tired of it. They got that fatigue and people got lonely and started to gather. And we started to get deaths and denials that COVID exists even when they're dying in the hospital. But a lot of our communities, they were going door to door with deliveries of groceries and other different supplies and fun games and things to do for for children um, with medications and information and, and that kind of stuff, which helped to keep that vital connection. Um, but, you know, some communities had very um, high infection and death rates, while others were, were, were rather low. But you know, they were started to do Zooms be, and, you know, everybody pivoted when uh, many of us, had, many of our communities had no experience in this and now we're experts. So, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, we, we look absolutely fantastic and professional up top. Uh, underneath, it's a completely different question. <laughs> but, but Georgia, I want to come on later to some of the work that MTV Sugar did um, using social and digital media. But, you know, what you were doing prior to COVID was producing um, soap operas, essentially, that, that needed people out in the community, film crews, actors. That presumably came to a stop, a sudden stop with COVID. And you're on mute. Sorry. Um, so you did say you wanted to come back to how we responded to COVID. So I, I might now be answering the question you want to ask me, but I think for us, it was transformational from day one, because what we realized is we could not be business as usual. We couldn't have a crew of 50 people with actors and makeup artists and whoever. And But we also realized pretty much overnight once global lockdown happened, that what we we are a behavioral and information campaign. And so that we had to make sure that we could produce content that we could get out as quickly as possible. So we came up with a series uh, called MTV Sugar Alone Together. And MTV Sugar Alone Together is uh, six countries. So we had actors from Botswana, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, where am I missing, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and the US. All of our actors were in lockdown. We produced 70 10 minute episodes um, from April through to end of August, uh, 2020. Um, and we uh, scripted them in blocks of 10 because what was really interesting was everything was changing so quickly the global the, the lockdown rules for each country was changing on a weekly basis so we had to make sure that we were staying up to date with the messaging now my team aren't experts on covid so we work with the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine a to review our scripts to make sure that as far as anyone knew our messages were correct um, and b also they did an evaluation um, in terms of what young people thought about COVID, what they'd learned from the series. And, and every night on YouTube, we premiered the episode and we had some of our actors talking to our audience and the audience were talking to each other. What we saw was really interesting because we saw at the 
the um, sort of early stages, people were quite were, were very scared um, in terms of all of the messages that were coming out. But when someone for the first time a couple of weeks in said that their aunt had died of COVID, we saw the community that we were building because we had a, an audience from really across Africa, I would say, and they were supporting each other. And they were then reflecting on their own experiences. And they were then talking about, um, we had someone who was HIV positive talking about the fact they couldn't get to their clinic because they couldn't go on public transport. So how did they get their HIV medication? And it was fascinating and and heartwarming to see the community that we built up. And, and we do know that from the, the London School evaluation, we know that um, at least um, uh, the, the, of the young people who'd watched it, almost all of them described it as entertaining, realistic, informative, and memorable. And entertaining, 91% described it as entertaining. For me, that's crucial because if we're not being entertaining, no one's gonna tune in tomorrow. So I think that's really important. And more than 90% said that they'd learn new facts um, about how um, COVID spreads, about what the symptoms are, how they can protect themselves, and crucially, where they can go for more information. So I think um, it was transformative for us. We, we have really adapted this work in terms of making sure, although we still, we, we've gone back to making the big TV productions as well, because there's still a space for it, but we can also be much more rapid um, in our in the way that we work um, and we use digital much more. And, and one more thing I'll add is the other thing that it changed was our peer education within communities because we, we have a, an amazing learning course with MTV Sugar that we take across countries, but we couldn't do that face to face. So then we turned to Facebook. And that was amazing, being able to still use those contents, still have our peer educators and reach out to young people in a way, as you said, Trevor, we all had to do it. It's, it's not ideal, it's not perfect, it's not as good as face-to-face, -face, but under the circumstances, it meant that we could still talk about the important things. Well, which gets us into addressing some of the solutions because these challenges are the mother of invention. And, and I think, Nadia, one of the things that so gripped me about the collaboration that you at UCSF Stanford had with the Maya Health Alliance was that you took these very simple animations and then you adapted them to fit the needs of girls and women in um, rural Guatemalan indigenous communities. Um, can you tell us the process of how all that came together? Sure. Yeah, um, it's really been a fun and interesting partnership, and we're it's been so great. We're trying to do more work together, um, and none of us have ever met in person still, so it's been quite the the COVID love story. Um, and but yeah, I mean, so we you know went through a formative design phase, you know, talking to community members about some of the challenges they were facing, and then as you were saying, Ben adapted some of the content that the digital medic team at Stanford had been using previously to that, you know, to the um, rural communities in Guatemala. And that was a very iterative process showing them the videos. Like, the, does this belt look right? Does this, you know, color of, was this representative of, you know, what someone would wear in these communities? And also the language, you know, we, we did it in three different indigenous languages, although there's many more. Um, you know, and very careful choices and discussions about what word was the appropriate word and would resonate and mean what, you know, we were hoping to convey. And, you know, it was interesting to me and surprising. It wouldn't have been what I would have expected the content to end up looking like, you know, it was kind of cartoons. It wasn't, wasn't as like realistic people as would have been my assumption people would have liked, but it really seems like it reflected the, what the community members, you know, thought would be the most trustworthy and help them understand the content the most. Um, yeah, it was a really exciting and interesting design process with really great findings. So that's yeah. even more fun. <laughs> One of the things we weren't able to get into in the last podcast with you was your work in India. And I'd love to know, you know, just how you and colleagues have collaborated with um, young women's groups in the subcontinent to address vaccine confidence. And I, I know this will be um, really striking for Georgia, given the work of um, uh, MTV Nishad. But um, can you tell us a bit about what you've been doing in India? Yeah, so I was fortunate to be, have a separate grant with the Vaccine Confidence Fund with some colleagues in India 
um, when we'd been working together for the previous few years on work with postpartum women and pregnant women. And really it came to light that during the COVID pandemic, even though the vaccine had been approved for pregnant and breastfeeding women, uptake was extremely low in that population. And India has a different set of norms and especially gender norms um, and issues with you know, women having limited mobility and lack of decision-making power. And we had some amazing community partners. This is in Northern India, who a local doctor who had over the past years developed WhatsApp groups that had hundreds and hundreds of pregnant and then breastfeeding women. And he would sort of answer their questions. Um, and so after, again, a formative phase with uh, women in this setting, we ended up deciding to try developing a chat bot, which we would deploy over these WhatsApp groups. You know, so again, we were leveraging systems that were already in place that had been, you know, were working in the communities as a way for him to provide information about, you know, infants and you know, and um, pregnancy and such. And um, it was very interesting, different, very different set of factors that were sort of. And isn't out, this? Um, oh, we lost you for a, a second. Sorry. I was just going to say there's a different set of factors that were the main barriers as opposed to our Guatemala study, which touched on many of the things Trevor brought up about mistrust in the government and, um, you know, myths and misperceptions about what was in the vaccine. In the Indian context, the women in, that we were working with, they all wanted to get vaccinated. Um, you know, they and a lot of them said they'd gone and tried to, but instead were facing barriers. I think this touches on a little bit of what Georgia was talking about, where they went to the health facility and the providers were said that they weren't eligible, even though you know they they Googled it, they knew that they were actually eligible. So it's a completely different set of factors, which led us to have to create different content, which actually we tried to address within the chat bot some tips and tricks for talking to your family, negotiate, you know, maybe being able to get the vaccine if you wanted to, and you know, different like approaches that they could use and similar to addressing um, potential barriers they might face with health providers. So it was really fascinating to see the different challenges faced by different communities. I wonder, Georgia, have you used chatbots? Um, I know that a, a, a partner of, of all of ours who's been on the um, VaxUp podcast, Shujaz, is using those in um, East Africa, in Tanzania and Uganda. But but how have chatbots uh, chat been um, adopted by MTV Sugar more broadly? So we've been using them in India with MTV Nished, and I would say to mixed effect. What we know is that when there is a, a human being at the end of the conversation, then a, a young per that, that young person is going to be more engaged with the human. And what we've seen with our work in India is we can get people to go onto the chatbot, but what we are struggling with at the moment, and and if uh, you have any advice and ideas, like definitely, you know, hugely appreciated and needed, quite frankly, because we're not seeing them go through the system. Now, I think partly is because chatbots, we all know what they do, we all know how they work, but they still are very um, in their infancy. There is still so much development to come, and so. For, for us, I think we still want to use them, but we are really aware that there is limits to them at the moment. And we want to see how we can work with the chatbot providers. Um, so we, we work with different um, chatbot companies to see how we can develop them further. And at, But that's what we all do, right? We learn, We and the best way to learn is actually when it's not successful in the first place, um, because that makes us try it again and again and, and do better. I can just jump in here. <laughs> I can jump in. Yes, we also we've had a lot of discussions as a team also about I think the women seem to like them, but we didn't actually end up seeing an impact on vaccine uptake. So, you know, I think that we as a team have been thinking about, you know, what was missing or, you know, is this the best tool? And also, you know, I think that this was a very specific setting where we were using a platform that was like already an established trusted these big whatsapp groups led by a doctor that women had been part of for a long time and you know we've had some we've wondered if these were you know deployed in a broader you know like over facebook or something like that we we have some questions about whether people would engage in the same way that they did in this like already trusted group so you know not to i think that i think we i definitely would agree that there's a lot we need more work that needs to be done on really making them engaging 
and yes, valuable um, and how much of an impact they can have. So yeah, and in, and involving real people, um, uh, and and Trevor, I suppose this is this is not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, embracing the shiny new technologies. It's really about the intertwining of what we know works, traditional approaches that work, and um, and harnessing these new tools to, to help us reach people more effectively. One of the things that I found so fascinating with some of the First Nation initiatives um, to promote vaccine confidence, and I know this is something you've been a part of, is the way in which um, traditional practices and um, modes of engagement have been utilized. And, and, and here's an example. Um, again, um, Morning Star Lodge um, and the first, um, sorry, the Star Blanket Cree Nation um, worked with um, community elders, the tribal leaders, to get them to, um, to sort of pray over the vaccines before they were distributed. And this wasn't so much a case of seeking to um, directly address vaccine misinformation, but rather that this is part of the fabric of the way the society lives. And, and I just wonder, have you seen this in other settings and how valuable is it? Ben, um, I don't know if people know this, but our traditions, indigenous traditions were actually illegal. A pot, you know, sweat lodges and potlatch ceremonies. We weren't allowed to speak our languages. We were taken from our traditional livelihoods on the land and put onto postage stamp communities and provided with, you know, rotten flour and, and, and nasty old, um, you know, grease to fry it up. But it, so we've been, you know, purposely separated from our culture through like settler humanitarianism a, a, approach here. And Everything, anytime we get together, anytime we communicate uh, around health messaging, we need to get back to our culture because that is healing for us. You know, there's this disconnection. Um, there's so much racism and we've been considered lower on the, uh, you know, social strata for so many years that embracing our culture and understanding who we are and connecting with our ancestors is part of our social determinants of Indigenous health. That's why it's intertwined like that. And each community does it a little bit differently. Even at our, you know, I, I work in HIV. I've been living with HIV for 32 years. We just had our ninth International Indigenous pre-conference on HIV and AIDS before the big international conference. And we do the same. We open with prayers. We bless the food. We call the ancestors in at the beginning and, and thank them at the end and let them go back to the spirit world. We have uh, smudging ceremonies. We have everything is a ceremony. Research is a ceremony, and it has to be. This is our health. You know, it's implementing uh, intervention on top of interventions. It all has to be one. You know what I mean? It has to be one good package, not just COVID talk, but all of it. All of our global health, all of our relations, even the, our grandfather rock have spirit. You know what I mean? We honor all of that, and that's incredibly important to us. To our health and well-being. Yeah, I, I've got to say on a personal note, I'm quite envious because um, when I when I look at my ancestors, more recent ancestors, it's more sort of oh my god, really. Um, <laughs> but oh, I've got uh, some of those ancestors too, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of blood in me. Yeah. <laughs> but but this sort of gets us into the impact um, side of the conversation, and, and 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 Trevor again, just to just to stick with you for a second. There was one thing that really stood out to me with the uh, Star Blanket Cree Nation work. They tested out two interventions on their Facebook page. One was essentially reposting messages that they got from established public health communities. Absolutely solid, absolutely, you know, first rate and couldn't complain about the accuracy. And then they also tested out messaging that the community itself had produced, which um, perhaps was not as detailed and hadn't gone through the same kind of rigorous evaluation. But what they found was that the community, I suppose this is to be expected, really resonated more with community-generated um, uh, posts and interventions. And that really, um, you know, notwithstanding the vaccine hesitancy that they, and 
presumably many of us feel, they were able to reach people and get to really concrete behavior change. And, and so my question for you, I think, is do you, how, I, I suppose, how have you really blended the traditional with the, with new approaches, new technologies, um, and new thinking to, to reach people in ways that perhaps in the last 15 to 20 years we haven't been able to do? I think that's a really important question. And it, it's, you know, some indigenous people will say, you know, we don't need anything from the Western world at all. We need to go back and back five, six hundred years. But that doesn't acknowledge the fact that indigenous people were evolving all along. And we would have evolved for this 500 years in our own way anyway. We weren't, wouldn't be the same. That's, 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 that's um, one thing that I think is important. But also the way that indigenous people use the colonizer's language is different than the way that um, that the mainstream, you know, native speakers from Europe would speak English or French or Spanish. So like, for example, in research, we use the word key informant in the Western world. And to indigenous peoples, that means somebody who's going to rat you out to the cop. Do you know what I mean? It's just so the, that's the way that word is used. So it's not just about of course, it's important to use indigenous languages, but it's also about the way we use the colonized, colonizers' languages too. But really getting back to the, you know, we need to find that balance. We need to use indigenous ways of knowing and doing and being, but we also take the best of the Western world and we use both. And there's been a, a Mi'kmaq elder here in Canada from the Atlantic coast who calls it two-eyed being. And to keep both eyes open, for, so you walk with one foot in both worlds, because some of the science was generated by Indigenous people anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like Indigenous people are scientists, doctors, and, and lawyers too. So it's, and we are part of the world. We, we're, not, we're, we're not an island. We are part of this world. And in, I can tell you this, Indigenous peoples have a lot to offer the world. It's not just Indigenous people saying, oh, poor us, come and help us. We have a lot to offer. Now people are looking at global management and these pandemics and they're going, maybe they were right. Maybe we need to do a better job of global management. Maybe we should take care of this mother of ours. <laughs> do you know, I'm, I'm listening to you, Trevor, and, and, and it sort of takes me back to something that MTV Sugar did. Um, and that was, I think quite bravely, inviting the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, indeed the World Bank and the Gates Foundation in, to evaluate MTV Sugar. And, and this was also a clash of cultures, a clash of civilizations. And, and I wonder, Georgia, did you approach this with, with both eyes open? How did you reconcile this? Uh, that's a good question, Ben. And I probably didn't have both eyes open because I I describe it as researchers speak a very different language to the language that I speak. Um, but we also know it's really important. It's really important for our funders to understand whether they're investing in projects that have impact. But it's really important for us to be able to have both a, um, a feedback loop that we can tap into at any time to be able to change our messaging if they're not working or emphasize messaging, um, but also be, to be able to track the work that we do. So we've been evaluated by the World Bank's DIME team, by the London School, uh, by Tulane University, amongst others. They've all done very different evaluations over 12 years. And my frustration is that I didn't really understand 12 years ago. I didn't perhaps think we would still be going 12 years later with MTV Sugar. Um, and I wish that we'd been able to say, right, let's do a 10 year longitudinal survey. But what's interesting is that every evaluation that's been done has been different. So we've had longitudinal, we've had an RCT, we've done biomarkers, we've done um, qualitative stuff. And what we see time and again is that if you've been exposed to MTV sugar, you're twice as likely to get tested for HIV. We know also that you're twice as likely to know about self-testing 
um, for HIV. And um, when with the biomarkers, we did it for chlamydia over an eight, eight month period. And we saw that young women who'd watched MTV Sugar were 55% less likely to have chlamydia than those who hadn't watched MTV Sugar. Now, I can't get into the whys and the wherefores because that's the different language. But for me, it has become invaluable to everything we do. And we now won't start a project unless we have an evaluation partner on board. It's it's opened my eyes up. It's a whole new world for me. I, I wonder, Nadia, how you, uh, how you react to this. Um, again, I think going back to the collaboration you had with the Maya Health Alliance, um, you were able to forge a, a very um, open, confident and comfortable relationship with the Alliance over monitoring and evaluation. And, and I guess, how do you see the, uh, the 21st century role of the researcher as partner, as Trevor said, as part of the ceremony? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it comes back to some of the things I was touching on earlier about it being a collaboration maybe from the beginning, right? I think, I don't think anyone felt like someone was, I mean, of course, from a scientific perspective, you want the evaluator to be unbiased, but I also, you know, think in this case, you know, we were all part of a team and very committed together to developing something that we felt was both reflective of the needs of the community, but also would make an impact and that, you know, and we wanted to know if that was the case and everybody, the local partners and everybody involved wanted to know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I think getting back to one of your earlier questions sort of about how COVID has changed things and thinking specifically about social media type interventions. One thing that I worked a little bit in this space pre-COVID and I think, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in the scientific community, like, oh gosh, these you can't really measure it. Like, what's the population? Like, what do you spread? You know, and I think a lot of what had been done to evaluate specifically social media type of campaigns, you know, had been just like asking people if they saw it or if they liked it or or if they thought it impacted their behaviors. And what's been really exciting to me is seeing that there's been this shift in people really trying to think through like, how can these interventions are important and we can measure them in like very rigorous ways. I'm actually collecting data from people, not just online, you know, or from facilities or actually looking at like health outcomes or health behaviors. And I've just been, it's really exciting to see this like shift and like open people. I think people, scientists are opening their minds a little bit to like, okay, it's not our standard study design where we make this sampling frame and we select, you know, we have to think outside the box a little bit, but it's been really exciting to see how many people are thinking of really innovative ways to measure the impact. Um, of uh, so much exciting work that's happening um, out there um, in like, various social media. And, and I think one of the fun things about the uh, Vaccine Confidence Fund is that it has captured a lot of the um, flowering of creativity. Uh, now, we're coming up to the top of the hour, and I know, Georgia, we are inter interfering, I guess, with a family <laughs> tradition for you, which is in the UK to get to dinner on a Friday night. My, my dad's just come in, gone. <laughs> Checking this watch saying, Georgia, hurry up. So look, last question for you all. Where do we go from here? I mean, from my mind, this has been a fascinating conversation with, with people from very different worlds coming together and sharing views. And to my mind, there's a lot of commonality. But where do you see this going? Um, Georgia, perhaps I could start with you. Do you know what I've been thinking about is the, the digital health world is so incredible and the innovations that are happening, uh, you know, way beyond sort of my brain in terms of really understanding where we'll be even in five years time. But there is a digital, uh, there, there's some, uh, there's something out there that I wanted to bring up in this conversation because it's almost so simple. Um, that it's almost going back to basics. Now, this takes us to Norway and Scandinavia, which is not my normal place of work, but there is a woman who's called Hell Sister, who I probably have totally mispronounced that, so I apologize uh, for my Norwegian, but it translates to Health Sister. And she's a nurse who was working in high schools in Norway, but her frustration was, although she was doing things face-to-face, -face, she wasn't reaching enough people. So what did she do? She went digital. She created a Snapchat account called Hell Sister, and she has become Norway and Scandinavia's personal nurse online. So young people can ask her any questions related to 
sex for the first time, um, how does the pill work, handling different difficult emotions, and she just replies on Snapchat. And I love that because it's very, very simple, but it is a real person at the end of it. So it's it's combining the both. And, and for me, I think that as we go very, as we work, as we bring digital into our world, and we have to, and it's amazing, it's brilliant, but we mustn't forget the real person as well, both, both in terms of the need of the client, but also who's talking to them at the other end. Nadia, your thoughts? I love that. I hadn't heard about that. I'll have to look it up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say to me, what's exciting and looking forward is that, you know, I think we know technology and access, you know, especially bringing it back to sort of thinking about rural communities or hard to reach populations, or especially women and girls. I think that as we move forward, and I think I see that people are finally stopping to be like, oh, well, you know, still so many people don't have access or don't have phones, but really the realization that times are changing really quickly and like more and more really indigenous communities are able to access information through these various approaches and or you know women who might not have as much power in the household actually can be connected in various ways so i really am excited and to see as that we can use these tools and they can reach the populations that i think there's sort of been this idea are still unreachable by some of these approaches thank you and and, and trevor last words go to you What's the way forward, do you think? Well, for for indigenous peoples, I, I don't, and when we're, we're speaking on a global level, we need to talk about um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the fact that consultation is really important. It's important to get the free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples. And I'll also understand that in addition to human rights, we have collective rights where you need to go to the indigenous authorities first ask permission to work in the community and then go to each individual and ask for, for their consent. So there's lots of recommendations in that UN um, DRIP document, but there, in Canada, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which did a, a great big investigation and there's 94 calls to action there. So it's really important. There's stuff already there for indigenous that we can implement. It talks about you know equitable partnerships and nothing about us without us. But I really like how Georgia talked about that um, the person-centered approach, you know, working with each individual. We, we're checking on people, knocking on their doors. Are you okay? Has anybody seen Trevor, you know? And Nadi was talking about um, providing, I mean, I mean um, talking about access. And access, we realized in, the, in many of our organizations and, and communities realized that access was incredibly important. And we, you know, many reached out for funding. There's lots of funding was released, in, at least in this country, for um, dealing with COVID. So we reward people by coming to meetings, by, um, you know, um, having a draw for for a, a cheaper cell phone so they could stay connected or tablets, you know. And we, a lot of a lot of us were doing training, Zoom trainings, and showing people here's how you do a Zoom and here's how you mute and do do all this. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things changed a lot of, there was a lot of systemic change through covid and i hope that for the other pandemics like tb has been around for hundreds of years hiv still here and hepatitis c we need to start learning the lessons we you know there was so much political will for systemic change for covid i think we need to start thinking about global pandemics that way and and w there needs to be political will for systemic change that's the only way we're going to get there well, thank you, Trevor, and, and, and thank you, Nadia and Georgia. What a fascinating conversation. So to our listeners and viewers, I hope you have found this conversation useful. Don't forget to subscribe, give us five stars on your favorite podcast platform, and check us out on our YouTube channel. So with that, thank you very much indeed. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Vax Up podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the topics discussed in the show, please check the show notes or visit us on our website at www.vaxuppodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Vax Up Podcast. And please consider subscribing to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, or on your favorite podcast platform. The Vax Up Podcast is produced by Hunuvat and NewsDoc Media. Writer and producer is Troy Espera. 
Graphic design by Michael Jarrett. Narration by Sherry C.B. And the executive producers are Eric Espera and Ben Plumley. Thank you, and see you next time.